So listen, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Manish Patankar. He grew up in Baruta, India, which is six hours north of Bombay, and attended the University of Bombay, first for a BS and then a master's in chemistry. He then went to Eastern Virginia Medical School, where he repeated his master's in chemistry and obtained his PhD in biomedical sciences. He did his post -doc at the same fine institution, and then in 2004, we were wise to recruit him. He's NIH funded, has an R01, DOD, et cetera. Uh, his work in terms of the NIH is focused on imaging of the collagen of tumors. And he is going to talk to us today about novel treatment strategies for ovarian cancer. Before I give him the mic, I want to say he's one of the nicest people I've ever met. We're very fortunate to have him in this department. He is generous to all of us. Thank you, Manish. Thanks, Laura. Uh, uh, really nice to talk to you about some of the work that we have been doing um, in my lab. Can everybody hear me back there? Okay. Okay. So, um, as Laura mentioned, we 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 have a major project going on on uh, on looking at changes in collagen structure in uh, in the in ovarian tumors and kind of trying to develop a diagnostic assay based on that, uh, potentially an in vivo imaging strategy. But I will probably not talk too much about it. I think I have, I may have a slide or two. What I want to talk about more is uh, more of the translational work that we are doing with, with experimental therapy. Uh, and I think this will come in important because now we have um, a great collaborator in Dr. Barolet. Um, who hopefully will be able to take some of the drugs that we are working on uh, into the clinic uh, with clinical trials. So I'll set up, uh, I'll talk about that a lot. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, small molecule drugs, so uh, you know, drugs that can be easily manufactured using organic chemistry type approaches, medicinal, medicinal chemistry type approaches, and also talk about some of our work that we are doing with Paul Sandel's group here at the medical school which involves biologics, more immunotherapy-related uh, drugs. So uh, let me start by just giving you a brief overview, and most of you already know about this now. Um, but you know, our, our whole understanding of ovarian cancer and, and how ovarian cancer is formed has completely changed in the last uh, few years. Um, we know now that there are different subtypes of this disease. The major we now categorize ovarian cancer as type 1 disease and type 2 disease. Um, in type 1, some of the major forms that you see are uh, low-grade endometrioid and clear cell ovarian cancers. And then in type 2, the ma most major form is high-grade clear cell ovarian cancer. And all of this understanding has really come from genetic analysis of tumors. Uh, and just last, this month actually, a uh, few days ago, there was, there's been a big major paper that came out in Nature Genetics, and we are still trying to figure out uh, what this paper means. But there are, they have identified doing large samples, like thousands of ovarian cancer uh, genome uh, studies. They are now uh, identified different susceptibility loci uh, that would lead to further characterization of these tumors in, into subcategories. So it's a, uh, it seems like a really major advance in our understanding. Now, what is what what it does to us in terms of treatment? Uh, it probably is going to help us uh, define different treatments per subtype, hopefully, um, and then so we can have drugs that can specifically go after some of these subtypes. Uh, whereas if you have high-grade serous ovarian cancer, maybe you have a different treatment. So. I think that understanding is going to be fairly critical in how we approach uh, patients and how we treat patients. So just in, in a very broad sense, uh, what we are finding is that some of the, these are the mutations that are most frequently found in ovarian cancer subtypes. Uh, in clear cell ovarian cancer, for example, you have these PIK3CA mutations, ARID1A mutations, and so on. Uh, in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, you mainly have BRCA mutations, and those are the generic, uh, you know, uh, 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 mutations that you see in families. 
but the more the major mutation that you see in almost all high grade serous ovarian cancer is in fetal tissue if you compare especially high grade ovarian cancer with other types of cancers melanomas and stuff like that it's very very striking that you don't really have that many that much going on at, uh, in, in mutation wise you really have only a few selected genes that are mutated and that is i think the enigma of of hybrid ovarian serous ovarian cancer is that with such you know fairly small mutations uh, in at least in terms of number of genes you get something so lethal uh, something that we really cannot treat even with the modern immunotherapy one of the ovarian uh, ovarian cancer i think is the is one of those cancers that has really shown nothing in clinical trials with with modern immunotherapy so far at least so that is really the enigma with with ovarian uh, cancer but those are the mutations that we when we know of now with further analysis we might actually find a few more but overall there is with serious ovarian cancer there is not much going on in terms of clinical trials so again from this understanding what we are also finding is that high grade serious ovarian cancer actually uh, quite a few of those cases are not developing on the ovary but they are really the malignancy of fallopian tube epithelium so the ciliated epithelium of the of the uh, i mean the secretory epithelium of the fallopian tube is what initiates first with some mutations and those cells then implant on the ovary or on the peritoneal surfaces giving you an appearance that it is actually an ovarian cancer but it could actually be fallopian tube cancer so that's for high grade serous ovarian cancer and then uh, i don't have a slide here but for for clear cell and and endometrioid type ovarian tumors there is now a clear association between endometriosis and and those tumors so there is it's not very uncommon to find endometriosis some parts of uh, of the cancer uh, of, of 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 an endometrioma that has uh, that looks like endometriosis but if you look at it from a molecular level you will start seeing loss of genes like ARN1A so that you can kind of see a transition from endometriomas to to ovarian cancer uh, in some patients so that's kind of where we are uh, so yeah this is this was the slide sorry if i missed but that's there is a clear link with endometriosis so what we have been doing in my lab uh, as um, one of the major projects i mentioned is looking at collagen so this is uh, an imaging strategy for second harmonic generation imaging this is a microscopic uh, strategy uh, that my collaborator here at bioengineering paul campanella has de has developed um, and this is collagen that is, that you see in normal ovarian tissue and you can see that's very haphazard it's all over the place each one of these is a fibril of collagen so this this microscopy strategy will only detect collagen um, whereas if you look at at ovarian tumors it's a really highly ordered kind of arrangement of the collagen uh, it's really wavy and nice little pattern that you always see with ovarian tumors uh, we're trying to figure out what this means uh, in terms of biology does it help the tumor for example are these like are these collagen fibers like tracks which allows the tumors to actually migrate on those tracks and then metastasize another point is when you have these tracks laid down can immune cells migrate on those can they go towards the tumor so what is the communication between the tumors and the immune cells can these tracks actually help the tumor control the immune cells which is what we are finding in a lot of cancers where there are immune cells inside the tumor but those immune cells are basically being hijacked and they are not doing their function uh they are actually now promoting the tumor so those th those type of studies are what we are going on or what are going on in the lab but at the same time with paul campanella's group we are also trying to see if we can use this imaging strategy to develop some kind of an in vivo imaging so we can locate tumors uh using this microscopy technique so i i won't talk too much about that but what i will focus a little bit on some of the animal models that we are trying to develop for ovarian cancer i just have a slide or two of that uh but and then talk briefly about ca125 that most of you know is a marker for ovarian cancer we'll talk about what ca125 is what it does um and then some of the approaches that we're using to 
uh, overcome the biology of this of this molecule, and then focus a lot on immunotherapies and, and the small molecule agents that we have been working on. Um, so, one of the challenges with ovarian cancer is that we really don't have any animal models for ovarian cancer. Uh, we have mice, so you can you can genetically engineer mice so that they develop ovarian cancer. For example, you can introduce a P53 mutation in the fallopian tube secretory cells, and they they can potentially develop ovarian cancer. But those are mice. Uh, the big anatomical difference between a mouse and a human. Uh, as far as the ovary is concerned, is that on the mouse, in, in the mouse, the ovary is surrounded by this covering called the bursa, which you don't have at all in, hum in, in humans. So when there is this the secretory epithelium that gets malignant, and then those cells then implant on the ovary, in the mouse, they actually implant on the bursa that is surrounding the ovary. So that interaction is going to be quite different than what you see in humans. Uh, the other problem is mice have an estrous cycle versus menstrual cycle in, our, in humans. And so from an endocrinology standpoint also, there are so many differences between a mouse model and, and human. Um, and so that has been a big challenge. In terms of clinical trials and developing therapies for, my, for, for ovarian cancer, that we are at a disadvantage there because what we typically are, have been following is that we do some studies in the lab, in vitro studies, then confirm them in a mouse model, and then there is nothing in between. We go directly from a mouse model to humans. And so there is really nothing in between, and I think that there is a need to bridge that gap somehow with, a, with another model. And that's where uh, our work now with uh, non-human primates uh, is, is, I think, going to be very important because uh, what we have found with uh, with non-human primates, this is working with the uh, with the primate center here on campus. What we are finding is that rhesus monkeys and marmosets and uh, a lot of these uh, animal non-human primates develop uh, endometriosis really spontaneously. So even in this colony here, you will get 10 to 30 percent of the of the animal developing spontaneous endometriosis, and that that percentage really matches quite well with the with the population with the, with the human population and also the treatment strategies that people are using for rhesus endometriosis for example are very similar to what we use in, in humans um, what another thing that we really found was because so everybody knew that there was endometriosis in rhesus we started looking into these these cases and what we started finding was there are a lot of these cases that had endometriosis, which also started, also had some adenocarcinomas in the peritoneum on the ovarian surface. Um, so it almost seems like it's clear cell or low grade endometrioid type ovarian cancer. What we don't know is if they really are clear cell or endometrioid ovarian cancer, right? So we are now trying to find out. Uh, using gene sequencing and RNA sequencing and histor uh, IHC in immunohistology, if those adenocarcinomas that you see in endo endometriotic rhesus monkeys are similar to the, the clear cell and the, and the endo low grade endometrioid tumors that we have in, 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 in women. And if, that's, if that is true, then we really have a spontaneously developing model. Of, uh, of ovarian, of some at least some types, subtypes of ovarian cancer, uh, and if that, and again, if that is true, then we can start going, taking our therapies from the lab to the mice to a research kind of a model before we start clinical trials. So we'll have something, a really, really true model for for this cancer in in non-human primates. The challenge, of course, is going to be how many cases of these of these monkeys. Uh, actually have those tumors, but there are there's a lot of work going on even at our primate center here where they are trying to develop transgenic methods uh, to develop different diseases. So there is some potential there as well. But even from a biology standpoint, it would be nice to see how those uh, how endometriosis then develops into ovarian cancer uh, in these monkeys. So there's a uh, there's a lot of work now going on in my lab on on that. 
and we are collaborating with Irene Ong, uh, who is a computational biologist here uh, uh, in the cancer center, and she's going to be analyzing the genetic data that we get from these models. Um, so let me now go and really talk about some of the novel therapies that we are working on. Uh, I will now talk about uh, MUC16 or CA125 as you probably know it uh, and what it does and how we can modulate this MUC16 molecule to increase an immune response against, uh, against the tumor. Uh, I will also so talk about immunocytokines which are, uh, which are these immunotherapeutic uh, molecules, uh, antibody based molecules that we are working with in Spawn Cell Mills group here at the, at the medical school. And then I'll talk a little bit about the, the small molecule uh, that we are now uh, doing, uh, uh, investigating. Um, there is a bunch of other approaches that we are using, but I don't think I'll have time to uh, talk about those. But there are co collaborations that I have with small companies around in uh, Madison, where we are looking at antibody uh, conjugated to drugs that actually go in and block the sodium potassium uh, uh, transport on these drugs and they are really, really lethal in, in, in killing cancer cells, but I don't think I'll have time to, to do that. So anyway, so looking at uh, the first topic is uh, MUC16 or CA125. So CA125, as you know, is a biomarker, but it, it's not a biomarker for early detection. Um, typically what you do is you start monitoring CA125 levels in patients who have received treatment um, and uh, you're basically looking at an individualized score of CA125. If that the levels of CA125 go up, then you, you suspect recurrence of, of the tumor. Um, and so uh, doing, you know, what we really need is a test over here, uh, which, can, which can detect uh, uh, ovarian cancer uh, in the precancerous regions. There are hints in the literature that CA125 levels probably are rising uh, two, uh, two years or so before clinical diagnosis of ovarian cancer. But even large clinical trials have not, have not proven that. And I think one of the problems with, with that is uh, the reason why we can't detect CA125 early is this is a really complicated molecule. I think one of the next slides uh, I will show you what this molecule really is. So CA125 really is a little, little tiny epitope of a very large molecule called MUC16. So when we measure CA125, what we are actually measuring is this whole molecule called MUC16. This is one of the largest molecules that you will see in, in human biology. So if you, if you look at an antibody, for example, the molecular weight of an antibody is 155 kilodalton. This guy here, we don't even know what the actual molecular weight is, uh, and it can change from patient to patient. Uh, but the molecular weight that we think uh, on an average is between three to five million Dalton. So compare an antibody 155 kilo Daltons versus a million, millions of Daltons. And there are some reports that this can be even as high as 20 million Daltons. So really, really large molecule. And the reason why it is large is from one end to the other end, there are about 24,000 amino acids. So that itself is, is huge. And then on top of that, there are multiple carbohydrate chains that go out from these, from these this protein backbone, which adds to the molecular weight of this molecule. It's a really, really large molecule. But that's what CA125, there are these repeat regions in this molecule that are basically the CA125. Uh, which are measured in patients. So this molecule is initially expressed by the tumor. It stays on the surface of the tumor. And then through some mechanism that we don't really know, it gets clipped off here. And this whole entire portion of the molecule will go out and go into the bloodstream, which is where we detect it at CA125. So that's, that's, that's the biochemistry uh, in, 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 in brief uh, of, this, of this molecule. So what we, many years ago now, we had a grad student who was just looking at interactions of natural killer cells, which is the immune cell, with ovarian tumor. And what she did was she took, uh, she took ovarian cancer cell lines that we had growing in our lab, 
and labeled it with an antibody so she was looking at CA125 expression or MUC16 expression on the surface. And she found that there were three populations really of, of these cells. Some cells had very low levels of MUC16 on their surface, some had medium and then others had very high levels of this molecule. When she added NK cells or natural killer cells to these, to these cultures, she was able to show that when you have really low levels of MUC16 on the surface, the NK cell, this is an NK cell here, that's a tumor cell, right? So when you had low levels of NK, of MUC16, which is shown here by green here, uh, then the NK cell would really go in and bind to that tumor cell and then will start killing the tumor cell. As the level of MUC16 increased, there was less and less of these conjugates of NK cells and tumor cells as you can see by this bar graph. Right? So there was something going on that we thought was very strange. And then after that we did quite a few, uh, uh, quite a few experiments. So just to show you how important that interaction between the NK cell and the tumor cell is, uh, we call that interaction as the immune synapse. So T cells, for example, will have, will also form an immune syn synapse because they, these guys have to actually interact with the tumor and kill the tumor, right? So what actually happens with these uh, immune cells is that if this is, this is just a, a prototype of an NK cell interacting with a tumor, uh, this is a, an, a tumor cell line here and this is an NK cell. When they interact, you will form this junction between those cells, which we call as the immune synapse. And there are a lot of molecules like actin and LFA1, which are, LFA1 is an integrin. All of these molecules really co co coalesce together at that synapse. They polarize to that synapse. So if the NK cell was separate from the tumor, all of these molecules will, will be almost evenly distributed around the surface of the NK cell. When these tumor cells and NK cells interact with each other, there is a signal that goes into the NK cell and all these molecules literally run towards that point of interaction between the tumor cell and the NK cell and you get this polarization of that. Subsequent to that then what you get is there are these molecules called perforins and, and granzymes which are proteolytic enzymes. They are also evenly distributed in the, in the, in the NK cell but when there is an immune synapse, all of these perforin molecules here will start again polarizing towards that immune synapse. And then they, they will start puncturing holes in the, in, the, in, case, in the tumor cell. These enzymes will then be released into the tumor cell and then the tumor cell will die because of the proteolytic activity uh, of, these, of these molecules uh, that are in these perforin granules. So that's kind of how an immune synapse works. Forming that immune synapse is very, very important for a, an NK cell or a T cell to go and kill the cancer cell, right? So what we think is happening is, and this is this picture, um, I don't know if you can see it, but this, this is the slide that is most important here. What we, what we did, did was based on that first experiment, we started making cancer cells that had MUC16 on its surface and a matching set of cancer cells that did not have MUC16 on the surface, right? And remember I told you that when you have MUC16 on the surface, then the NK cells were not forming these conjugates. When you don't have MUC16, then they were forming the conjugates. And that's, that you can see, I don't know if you can see back there, but this is a tumor cell here in red. And if you see down here, there are, it is being attacked by NK cells. There's a little cell and you can probably see it better here. So there are, two or three different NK cells attacking the tumor cell in the middle, right? So this was happening when you don't have MUC16. So this is a MUC16 negative over cancer cell line. When you have MUC16 on the cells, there you can see the tumor, you can see the NK cells, but the NK cells are just lying around, around the tumor. They're not forming, you can see, they're not forming the synapse, which requires those molecules to go and form uh, and polarize to the surface. They're just not forming any of those interactions. Um, and we quantified this and we were able to show that when you have MUC16 there, those immune synapses were not forming. So the, the implication of that is that when you don't have those immune synapses forming, then you don't, you don't have that ability of the NK cells to go in and kill the, kill the tumor cell. And the tumor cell basically can escape NK cell recognition. So what we are, 
I have been proposing is that MUX 16, the value of MUX 16 or the value of CA125 is not just in using it as a biomarker for ovarian cancer, but it's also, there is also a biology to it and the, the tumor is making this molecule uh, as big as it is. You know, it, it, it takes a lot of energy for the tumor cell to actually make this molecule, right? So why is it spending this much energy? One of my colleagues had uh, uh, said that tumor cells or, or any biological system, they don't have any hobbies. They're not making molecules just for the sake of making a molecule. So there is a purpose for this, and we think that the purpose is that it actually helps them to uh, circumvent any kind of immune uh, and, uh, reaction. So this is another, this is a, a different assay. Um, again, what we are trying to measure is interactions between NK cells and ovarian cancer cells when there is MUC16 present, as shown by these red lines, or when there is less MUC16 present. And you can see that when you have uh, MUC16 knockouts, so this situation here, you have a lot of these doublets, so these interactions, whereas when you have MUC16 present, those, each one of these dots is representative of those doublets. Um, so this is a fairly visual kind of a representation of how those interactions work. So this is an assay that we do with a uh, flow cytometer uh, in, a, in the flow cytometry lab uh, here at Cancer Center. So this is just uh, to show you that those interactions are really dependent on the amount of MUX-16 that you have present on the surface. Uh, these are, we have done a lot of experiments with human NK cells, with murine NK cells, and each time we see the same result. When you have MUX-16 present, the amount of killing that you get of the, of the tumor cell by the NK cell is less than when you don't have MUX-16 present, right? So um, it's, it's fairly, uh, a, 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 you know, a reproducible observation that we have made. Uh, so we, we took these tumors that have MUX16 present and MUX16 negative tumors and put them in mice. Um, and what we were able to show is that when you have MUX16 present, the, if this is a survival flaw, uh, uh, and you can see that the survival is much less. So within 90 to 100 days, all of the mice in those groups were dead. Whereas if you have MUX16 negative tumors that you put in, um, then they, survive much longer. And in fact, when we start looking at these, um, these, uh, these animals that are dying and start looking at the tumors that are being formed in these, we find that in these tumors, they have somehow recovered the ability to make MUX16, right? So we, well, the, when we make these, engineer these cancer cells, there is always some kind of a leakage. So there is, it's not a 100% MUX16 knockdown. Uh, so these tumors that are forming, actually have a little more MUX16 than when we initially injected them at the start of the experiment. So it almost seems like the immune system is editing the tumor. So they are selectively going after the tumors that have low MUX16 because they can go after them. They can go and kill those tumors. But the ones that survive are the ones that have more MUX16 on them. And those are the ones that then lead to uh, the death of the animal. So there's a lot of work that we are now doing on how we can modulate this system. Um, and one, one more thing uh, that we see in those MUX16 um, positive tumors, we don't see these are these brown dots that you see are macrophages. So we don't see, we, we see macrophages that are surrounding the tumor, but when you have MUX16 negative tumors, the macrophages are all over in that, in that tumor microenvironment. So we think that there is an immune component to this that needs to be really uh, looked at. Um, so what we are trying to do, and I'll skip this, um, what we're trying to do now is to modulate the tumor's ability to make, to make MUX16. And so we are com coming up with nanoparticles that have these small RNA molecules that can go in uh, and stop the tumor from making MUX16. So now you will have a MUX16 uh, negative or uh, a, a cell line that's almost naked of MUX16, and then hopefully then we can get NK cells to go in and attack it. So that's one approach that we are trying to use. Uh, another approach that is uh, now we are, have a collaboration with Chris Shah's lab at the Discovery Center. Um, what we are trying to do now, use uh, we are trying to use these gene editing uh, 
new techniques that have been developed, successful techniques that you may have heard. But we are trying to see if we can we can make use of the largeness of this molecule and start introducing epitopes using gene editing uh, methods, epitopes that can be easily recognized by the immune system. So instead of blocking the MUC16 expression, try to make it, try to engineer it so that it actually starts making epitopes that will actually attract the beta immune cell. So there is a bunch of epitopes that we are looking at, uh, but what this would mean is that when you have a patient, you would then use these nanoparticle based approaches to, to introduce these gene editing, uh, uh, gene edited epitopes into MUC16 so that now you, the immune cells can go in and hopefully look at the epitope, be activated by it, and then kill the tumor. So there's some work uh, in my lab that's going on on that front. Then we, if we are successful or even otherwise, what we also want to do is make sure that we give the immune cells in that patient enough power, enough juice, so that they can actually go in and kill the tumor. And that's where our work with the immunocytokines comes in. So immunocytokines are these antibody-based molecules. They have an antibody, and to the antibody you have a cytokine attack. So IL-2 or IL-3 or IL-12, uh, IL a bunch of different cytokines that you can attach to these immune to these antibodies. So the the goal here is that this antibody will be targeted to a specific molecule on the surface of the cancer cell. And it can be MUC16, it can be some other molecule that you find exclusively overexpressed uh, on a cancer cell. So this antibody will go in and bind to the cancer cell and then oh, it just the binding of the antibody to the cancer cell will recruit some immune cells like NK cells and macrophages into the tumor microenvironment. Once the immune cells are there in that tumor microenvironment, then this IL-2 or the cytokine that is attached to the antibody will, will start working its magic. It will actually start activating the cancer cell, uh, the immune cells even more, which will lead to rec recruitment, additional recruitment of T cells and other immune cells into the microenvironment, create a really highly immunogenic kind of uh, uh, environment into the, in the tumor, and that will lead to killing of the cancer cell. So we are actually, we did a lot of work initially with this, these molecules. Uh, uh, in our, in, uh, we basically are looking at antibodies that bind to epithelial cell adhesion molecule or EPCAM, which is overexpressed on ovarian cancer cells. Uh, when Joe Connor was here, he actually had a clinical trial, a phase one trial that uh, he did with, with these type of molecules. And at that time, the, 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 the company that was promoting the trial was UMB uh, 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 Merck. And uh, they just made, uh, just after the trial was ended and we had all this nice data, we were ready to submit a lot of grants and stuff on this. Um, just at that time, the company made a business decision that they were not going to pursue this molecule, right? So we, basically, we were relying on the company and had nowhere to go. Uh, to get this molecule, so that whole effort really uh, came to a standstill. Um, and we uh, lost quite a few years on this. But now what we have done is we have found another collaborator um, who used to work with Merck and who actually was the one who developed these immunocytokines. He split from Merck and formed his own bio, bio uh, company in Boston. And now he has come up with a different design where the, the immunocytokine is, uh, uh, is again an EPCAM in immunocytokine, so it binds to the same molecule, but the immune, uh, but the cytokines are actually attached to the light chain of the antibody, so it's a different region. And there are reasons for that. Um, we think that by doing this, we will get less of toxicity from these molecules. So now we have a really good source of, of, uh, of, uh, of these immunocytokines, and that's what we are working on. So just to show you how these things work, the, there are epitopes on the tumor cell, which this antibody will bind. That will recruit in an NK cell. The NK cells will start forming that immune synapse and start killing the tumor cells. But those cytokine molecules will also then recruit additional immune cells into the microenvironment and kill the tumor. 
so this is a, a, a synapse that you will see when we add these immunocytokines. This is a cancer cell, that's an NK cell. And you can see that green there is polarization of the IL-2 receptors. Remember the IL-2 molecule that is on the cytokine is now polarizing the IL-2 receptor to the synapse. So that's the synapse and that's leading to activation of IL-2 receptor which is further activating the NK cell. Right? So those, um, so that's that and again this is the other assay uh, showing doublet between the NK cells and the ovarian cancer cells. When we have the, the immunocytokine added, you can get a lot more doublets both with NK cells uh, and I won't go into all the details but there are two clouds if you can see there is one cloud here, one cloud here. Um, this one cloud is the NK cells that are present in our, in, in our circulation and these guys are the monocytes and the macrophages that are present in our circulation. So both the NK cells and the macrophages get recruited with these immunocytokines and they can, they, we are basically arming them to kill the tumor. So what we are now trying to do is to take the moxifene work and the immunocytokine work and put them together. So we are trying to uh, block moxifene expression on the tumor. So b just by doing that, we will get more NK cells recruited. And then we further arm the NK cells with the immunocytokine so that we can get even more killing as you can see here. This is with moxifene knockout and then the immunocytokine added, we get more killing than when we have moxifene on the tumor, right? So that's the other thing that has come out of this is if you have to, even with immunotherapy, you have to pay attention to the MUX16 levels on the tumor. So MUX16 can really also dampen the effect of MUX, of immunotherapies that we are using in, in these trials. So we have a, we have a project with a company that was uh, running clinical trials with folate receptor antibodies. And what they were finding is that in patients that had less levels of uh, MUX16 or, in, or CA125 in their serum, the antibodies seem to be doing better. And this is in clinical trials. So again, it comes down to, we think, the level of MUX16 is very important. And we have to modulate it somehow. Um, and hopefully the, the methods that we are using would be good. So this is another way of looking at the synapse. This is called imaging cytometry a new instrument that we got a, a couple years ago in the cytometry lab. Again, you can see when we have the immunocytokine added, you form these immune synapse. This is a bright field image of the cancer cell and the immune cell. And you can see that those, they form these immune synapses uh, and conjugates with the, the, the tumor cell. But when you don't have any, uh, any uh, immunocytokine, there, there are associations between those cells, but they are not actually immune synapses. So you can see this CD25, which is IL2 receptor. It is spread out evenly on the immune on the immune cell here. Right? So these are corresponding fluorescent images of that same bright field image. Right? So you can see the IL CD25 or IL2 receptor is evenly spread out on the immune cells. But when you have the Im immunocytokine added, it's not evenly spread out. It's actually polarized at that junction between the cancer cell and the immune cell. So that's uh, that's showing that the immunocytokine working uh, and making these immune cells go after the tumor. So this is some preliminary data we have got in a mouse model uh, showing that when we add these immunocytokines, we get increased survival of the, of the, of the mice. Uh, and we are further uh, exploring this with Paul Sandel's group. Uh, eventually, what we kind of want to do is use three, two or three different types of immunotherapies against ovarian cancer, as I have said. Immunotherapies so far have been quite unsuccessful against ovarian cancer. So we think that a multi-pronged multi approach uh, with immunotherapy is probably going to work. So we want to activate not only the NK cells, but also uh, activate macrophages that are in the tumor microenvironment. And we can only do that by using multiple different approaches. With all of this immunotherapy uh, thing, uh, one of the biggest problem with immunotherapy is the cost of this therapy, right? We are talking about making bi these bi large biological molecules and they're, it's always going to be expensive. Now in a, in a developed country, uh, in the Western world especially, uh, maybe you can afford uh, with, with some of these therapies, you can afford to do these. 
but in the developing world it's almost impossible not just because of the cost but also because of you know how are you going to transport this to the patient to the hospital you know um, so all these logistical issues are going to be extremely important and so though that's the biggest drawback i think of, of these type of uh, modern therapies and so therefore uh, what really is going to work and what's going to be most effective are small molecules that are hardy molecules you can synthesize them uh, and and you, you can transport them anywhere you know so that's really something that we have to continue to work on and with that in mind uh, we have have projects uh, where we actually are looking at some of the natural products and some of these known molecules that we know can kill cancer cells. Uh, so with this whole thing started with some of the initial work with, that we did with ginger. Um, you know ginger as a spice. Um, and you know, we used to, we just, just by chance, we ended up with a, a ginger extract that somebody gave me uh, and we tested it on cancer cells. And that seemed to kill the cancer cells. So this, this, this whole thing started, we started making the extract in my lab. Uh, so I would just go to grocery store uh, and buy all the ginger that was on the, on the rack, <laughs> bring it to the lab and use this kind of an apparatus and, uh, and uh, make our own extract. Uh, and it didn't matter. I tried Whole Foods, I tried, uh, I tried in cops and any place. And it would give us the same result with that extract. It would always kill the, the cancer cell. Um, so, and you can see these are proliferation assays that we did with the multiple ca cancer cell lines. And you could see when you add the extract, which we called SDGE at that time, ginger extract, and it would kill the, the proliferation of these cancer cells. Um, I looked, I got, we had initially got a sample from India, and then we made our own uh, extracts and they ran GC, uh, uh, LCMS and stuff on this, looking at the composition. And you can see that they are very similar, no matter where you get this ginger from. It's very similar when you uh, extract the ginger, right? So we started looking at each, so each one of these peaks is a specific compound that's in the extract. We started looking at the activity of each one of these and realized that there were these two peaks that were the most active. So if we only give fewer forms of those two, then we would get essentially the same result uh, that we were seeing with the whole extract. So from an FDA standpoint, that is exactly where we want to go. Just look at pure molecules and not extracts. So these two molecules um, are actually isomers. If you know, there are cis and trans isomers. So they are, one is a cis isomer, the other one is a trans isomer. This one here, this peak is a molecule called Miral, M-E-R-A-L. And then this one is Uranial, uh, which is the trans isomer. So they are exactly the same molecule, just a double bond. Uh, and you can get, actually, you can get a mixture of this uh, called Cipla. And if you go, I mean, it's, it's a normal FDA approved, USDA approved food additive that you would see in many, many food products. So citral is, you know, we all ingest citral at some point. Um, so we did a lot of studies showing that these molecules were actually killing the cancer cells, and I won't go into all the details of this. Um, we worked with, uh, uh, with a group here in pharmacy to take these molecules, neural and geranial, put them in nanoparticles, and gave it to mice that had tumors, um, and were able to show that when we gave these in high enough concentration, you could block the tumor growth. And these are breast tumor, uh, this is a breast tumor model, but just three, give, three doses of this would lead to fairly substantial decrease in the tumor growth. We've done, you know, this is just looking at the size of the tumor and stuff, and you can see there is a clear difference. So how does this, this molecule work? So what we think it does is it actually goes into the cells and it causes a rapid increase. Within like five minutes, you'll see an, a rapid increase in reactive oxygen species or oxygen radicals, right? Our ROS is what we typically call them. This is an assay showing you that. So this is, these are cells. Uh, you can see bright filled images and then we added a dye that when, it, when there is oxygen radicals that die, that dye will start fluorescing. So without the drug, there is no fluorescence. When you add the citral, uh, you see a lot of fluorescence, a lot of flash, and that's what we are measuring here. Um, so we know that that's, that is one of the first things that happens in these cells, right? Um, and then uh, 
we, d we have done a lot of studies, but basically what we think is that when citral goes in, it forms these oxygen radicals. These oxygen radicals then lead to DNA damage and then that leads to activation of C53, which is a tumor promoter. Uh, what we are finding is that even, uh, I think I mentioned in one of the first slides that C53 mutations is one of the primary molecular event that we see in cirrhosis ovarian cancers. We are finding that some, even some of the mutant C53 get activated and that you can kill uh, the cell because of the activation of this C53. So, if you block, if we have drugs where we can use uh, where we can block reactive oxygen generation, uh, radical generation. And if you block it here, then citral is not effective, right? If you let this happen, but if you block it at P53, then again, you don't get activation, uh, you don't get cell death. So we have kind of dissected this whole pathway uh, to show that reactive oxygen species generation is the most uh, a crucial event that allows citral to be active. So, and again, we did a lot of structural uh, studies uh, uh, where we looked at, so this is the molecule citral, uh, niral, as, as I said, is a cis form. This is the trans form. If there is an aldehyde group, if you remember your organic chemistry, and if I, if you make this into an alcohol here, this molecule here is not active, right? So, there is that little change uh, which is important. So we started looking at this molecule. There is nothing fancy about this molecule. It's a very simple kind of a molecule. So we started looking at what is in this molecule that makes it potent. And we find that there is this double bond and this is CA2, which is important. If you look, there are so many different molecules that have that have that same structure that are also shown to have anti-cancer activity. So if you look at the literature, there's all these cinnamaldehydes and all these are really beautifully flavorful molecules. If you can smell them, you know, uh, they are really, really nice. And this is again cinnamaldehyde made in cinnamon, right? So all these natural products, but they all have this kind of a structure. Now, why are plants making this molecule? That's a really fascinating story. They are actually doing this to protect themselves from insects, you know, because there is absolutely no need for a plant other than for pollination purposes or you know, uh, those type of things. They don't have to make these molecules, but they use this, again, because they're spending all this energy to make this molecule, right? So why are they doing this? One of the reasons they're doing this is to block insects and parasites. So just as in our case with the cancer cells, these molecules are killing the cancer cells, in the plant, they can kill parasites using these molecules. And I'll show you in just a minute why we think that happens. But all of these molecules, you'll see there is a double bond and a C double bond O. And in this case, there is a two, two double bonds and the C double bond O. So if you look at the chemistry behind this, they all have something very similar. Curcumin, which is in turmeric, uh, it has the same thing. It has two double, bond, uh, two double bonds on either side and a double bond curcumin. So we think that they are all are working together. And then that led us to identify ato one and YM155. So YM155 is already in clinical trials as an anti-cancer drug. And atoac actually is an anti-malarial drug. So when I go to India, just as a prophylactic thing, I get this called uh, malarone tablets, right? So malarone has two, has two components. One is atoac and the other one is proguanin. So atoac is, we have been testing atoac now, and we're trying to see if we can repurpose atovac one from an anti-malarial to an anti-cancer agent. But it's, it does the same thing. You add it to the cell. The first thing we see with any of these molecules, the first thing we see is an increase in reactive oxygen radicals and that leads to cancer cell death, right? Um, so we are now, because this is FDA approved already, uh, Dr. Barolet is really interested in taking this now to the clinic. We need some in vivo data and in mouse models and stuff. Uh, which we are trying to get right now, but this would be a really ca great candidate for for uh, to take to the clinic for ovarian cancer. And then this molecule is already in clinical trials, um, and we want to see if we can use it for ovarian cancer clinical trials. So that's another focus of our group right now. So how do these? Why do the oxygen radicals go up? And then uh, we have to go back now to biochemistry, right? All the or the glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and, and the electron transport chain that we 
we have been uh, trying to avoid for so long to study, uh, it, this, it comes back to that. So one of the reasons why we think it works is coenzyme Q, which is important in transporting electrons from the mitochondria. Look at the structure of that. This is that double bond O and the double bond. Look at this part of, of atovacone, it's exactly very similar to that. Right? So this guy here is important in transporting the electrons in the mitochondria. And what we think is happening, so you know, you, you have glucose going in and then the, in glycolysis it's converted to pyruvate, then pyruvate goes into the Krebs cycle. In Krebs cycle you get a whole bunch of NADH and FADH2 form. Those molecules then go into the electron transport chain. It's a, it's a really fascinating way of developing, a, generating ATP. Um, so what happens is bit, there are different complexes in the mitochondria that are shuttling electrons from complex one all the way to complex four and that is creating these proton gradients which are then driving the ATP synthase to make ATP. Right? It's a really fascinating uh, uh, way of generating ATP but the shuttling of electrons requires ubiquitin on or coenzyme Q. And so what we think is because of those structural similarities, atovac one or any of these molecules goes in and blocks ubiquinone's ability to shuttle electrons between these complexes. And because of that, then what happens is that you start getting oxygen that has not fully accepted all of those electrons and you get uh, oxygen radicals being formed. So you're basically blocking it here. And so atovac one as I said, is anti-malarial. And this is exactly what it does in, anti in the malarial parasite. It blocks the mitochondrial electron transport chain in the, mi in, the in the malarial parasite, and that's how it can kill the cancer. It can kill the parasite. So we're trying to see if we can use that same mechanism back in the cancer and start killing cancer there because it can block the mitochondrial electron transport chain. So that's uh, we've been looking at these complexes. These are really large protein complexes. Uh, so this is the protein complex all in green and this is that little molecule uh, and I think this is uh, the citral molecule but we have been doing all these graphing studies uh, with, uh, with different molecules. The whole uh, goal now is to, okay we have atovac one we have YM155 which, which we can take directly to the clinic but can we do, can we have a better atovac one can we have a better YM155 because we have all this knowledge of how these things are working. So we are trying to, we are working with the medicinal chemistry group uh, in pharmacy trying to make new atovac, new derivatives of atovac one that will be even better uh, that we can basically use to target the tumor and not other things. So that one of the dangers with this is that the toxicity might be high because this is a central mechanism that is present in all cells, right? So we want to make drugs that will selectively go to the tumor uh, and then block the electron transport selectively in so there is a lot of medicinal chemistry that we have to do, but one of the things that we also have to do is use these type of graphing studies to make them selectively go into the into these complexes and be really effective inhibitors of ubiquinone uh, of of uh, coenzyme Q. So that's what we are doing. Uh, again, this is the pathway that we see uh, uh, these molecules, which we call as unsaturated carbonyl compounds go in for do oxidative stress or increase oxidation oxidative radicals and that leads to uh, that leads to several responses p53 activation and that leads to killing now the problem with this approach and and there have been clinical trials with curcumin and all that and none of them has really worked one of the problems that we have found is that the cancer cell is smart when it starts seeing this increase in oxygen radicals it does its best because it knows now that its survival is at stake. So it now starts working on mechanisms to reduce the oxygen radicals. So what it actually starts doing is there is a there is a transcription factor called NRF2, which is really a potent antioxidant. Uh, it, it instigates many antioxidant pathways, right? So superoxide with butane, glutathione, all of that synthesis is controlled in a large part by this. So as soon as the cancer cell senses this increase in oxygen radicals, what it starts doing is it starts increasing the activity of this transcription factor. 
And so then you start getting more glutathione into the nucleus, you know, more catalase and superoxide, any of these some mechanisms that are going to neutralize those oxygen radicals, they start getting kicked in. So this is, we are saying that this is some form of uh, resistance to chemotherapy. Right? So if, if you have a chemotherapeutic agent that is going to increase oxygen radicals, then you have to be careful about these, these compensatory mechanisms that are being expressed. Right? And so, because if you, if you let these guys, these, this mechanism go, then you are going to have resistance of the tumor cell against that, that chemotherapeutic agent. So what we are now trying to do is combine these compounds like atovaporin and, and OIM-155 with inhibitors of NRSA. Then there are a few inhibitors that will go in and block the activity of NRSA. So the goal is to increase the oxygen radicals but stop the cell's ability to neutralize those oxygen radicals. So we can give combination therapies and these are all going to be small molecule agents. So again, cost will be less of an issue. Uh, and also stability of these agents will be less of an issue. So that's the work again that we are also looking at is trying to develop novel agents that will be blocking NRS2 activity. So again, there's a lot of medicinal chemistry that we have to do. So that with, in conclusion then we have, uh, I think what I talked to you about was uh, uh, ovarian cancer really has multiple subtypes. Uh, so it's one name, but there are many from a molecular standpoint. Uh, doing non-human primate models potentially we can address uh, the issue of not having any good uh, models for this cancer. Um, and then I've, I talked to you about com, com, uh, immunotherapies and how much histidine could modulate uh, immune cell responses. So we have to uh, be careful about you know potentially uh, regulating muscitine levels and combining that approach with immunotherapy. Um, we, I talked to you about these alpha, beta, and tractor natural products, the small molecule agents and how they interact and, but, uh, and their, their basic mechanism of which, uh, which we, are, so we are basically trying now to combine uh, different approaches to these, uh, these small molecule agents, potentially also with immune therapy. Uh, so all those combinations are con currently under investigation. So I will stop there. Um, all of this work, really, we have multiple collaborations, both on campus, uh, and uh, and I think I have not even mentioned a few here. Uh, this is an old slide that I was trying to re recycle, uh, but this is our group, uh, uh, and this is not even updated. I still have Sandy's name on it, um, but uh, we are working with the Primate Center, and Irene Ong um, is mentioned here. So she's our computational person that is helping us with the genus uh, sequencing. Uh, you can see a bunch of different collaborators. We have just recently started this new collaboration, uh, and I, I hope I'll get a chance to talk to you about that. It's a fascinating one. This is again looking at how you can sense heat from a cell, right? And this all started because one day I was driving and listening to NPR Science Friday, and this woman, uh, uh, from Caltech, mechanical engineering, has developed these spectrum films in that, uh, of, that, can, that are extremely good at sensing heat. So this is basically these spectrums are polymers that are in plants. And so if a warm-blooded animal comes across, the plant can actually sense it from a distance, right? They can sense a warm-blooded animal come because these spectrum polymers are so good at sensing, uh, sensing heat. So we're trying to see if we can use that for our, for development of different diagnostic assays and stuff. So it's really fascinating. I've got the chair of electrical engineering now uh, interested in this. So hopefully I'll get a chance to talk to you. It's really exciting. Uh, so and with that, I'll end. I don't know if I have time for questions. Sadly, we do not have time for questions. That was fantastic, Manish. And I, I just want to make a couple editorial comments as people leave. First of all, uh, Manish's comment on this being a heterogeneous tumor is a gross understatement. About three or four years ago, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, with about five or 600 fresh ovarian cancer patients, tissues, et cetera, showed that the molecular biology here is heterogeneous, to say the least. So de developing therapy 
when you have 25 cancers you're dealing with is complicated. I would argue that because it's so cheap to get the human genome thing accomplished at this point that we're going to see some rapid changes in the field. I do think that immunotherapy is going to be the cutting edge answer for ovarian cancer at some point in the near future. The annual SGO meeting next year, one of the major focuses is going to be on immunotherapy. We have a guest speaker from MD Anderson who's a melanoma specialist, which of course they've had tremendous success with immunotherapy around melanoma. And, you know, I think the work that Manish and his colleagues are doing is absolutely critical and important, and we are going to see a lot coming from this in the future, particularly now that, you know, the division in the form of Dr. Lisa Barrelett has an active participant in terms of developing clinical trials. So on that bright, cheerful note, have a great day. Thank you.